Hello and welcome. My name is Ben Judah, a research fellow here at the Hudson Institute in Washington, D.C., and I'm delighted to be joined here today in the ether by Ian Duncan Smith, a leading member of the UK Parliament, former leader of the Conservative Party and co-chair of the Interparliamentary Alliance on China for a conversation on what next between Beijing and the West and the future of British foreign policy. Thank you for joining us, Ian. My pleasure. My pleasure. I thought we would start with a very simple, but very big question, which is, is China a threat to Britain? OK, right. So the answer to that question is yes, but not only to the UK. I think the truth is that um, the free world has uh, marched somewhat blindly, I think, into the embrace of, uh, of, a, of a Chinese Communist Party. Uh, that has very clear and strategic understandings about how it wishes to dominate a whole series of areas, both in the marketplace and in geopolitics. And so I think if you look carefully at what uh, President Xi says and others, you will see there is a very clear pattern as to where they wish to be by 2040. And to do that, they have needed the market to provide the money. So the UK over the last 10 years, in line with many other countries, has uh, gone to China to get all sorts of things done, production, and as a result of that, we've seen China uh, coming back into the world of trade, uh, but intriguingly, um, not obeying any of the rules that uh, exist in that rules-based order of the World Trade Organization, breaching these things by uh, technology theft, by uh, copying, uh, essentially by trying to set up and underbid companies. Huawei is a good example, underbidding companies in the in the area of uh, telecom systems, so that <clears throat> once there are about 10 or 12 of these companies in the free world, now there are literally three. Uh, all of the others have gone out of business because there was nothing in it for them. And China is now dominant in this area. So you can see this, no matter whether you're a rare earth materials, whether it's um, the Belt and Road project, or whether it's straight commercial uh, impropriety. Yes, uh, China poses a threat because this is yet not the end. And the end is uh, complete dominance. And I think we have to recognize politically uh, and in geopolitical terms, not least of which uh, some of the more threatening elements of their uh, forecasting is, is really a problem for us. So yes, but not just for the UK, for the free world. So my next question to you is, do you believe that China's coronavirus handling was an international crime? Well, I, if I step away from defining it, I can tell you that I wrote about this uh, a little while ago in the Daily Telegraph paper here in the UK. Uh, and in it, I wrote that if you look carefully at the dates in which uh, this process unfolded, you will begin to see that there is a second theme running. It is my belief, and I think it's borne out now by the dates, uh, that the Chinese, the Chinese government uh, on the 15th of December, I think, was due to have a, a, a further set of sanctions imposed on it by the United States, which I think was certainly over a trillion, should have had a big effect on the Chinese economy. So what they needed to do was to get through that and agree to the trade deal, which was then be signed on the 15th of January. And so I think if you look at that carefully, you'll see that there was a deal of suppression of information about human-to-human uh, -human transmission, which now we believe uh, was known about in at least November, some say earlier, through December and into January. And it wasn't until late January uh, that there was any indication uh, that uh, uh, China accepted and admitted they had an epidemic on their hands. Now, the WHO is not without fault here, uh, but I, we're not here to discuss them. So I do believe that in desperation, to make sure they had nothing to disrupt that trade deal, uh, they made sure that none of this came out as it might have posed a threat. So the question then you asked me was, is this some sort of a crime? Well, in human terms, it does become one because you know, without that early warning, uh, there's no question now that the coronavirus was being spread to, to Europe, to Italy particularly, uh, even the UK and various other countries long before we knew not just of his existence, but of the kind of threat that it posed. And so we were all somewhat unprepared. So should China be held responsible? And what are your views on this topic of reparations that's been mooted by uh, some in the Conservative Party? 
Well, they're not alone. I think there's a number of people that have uh, have uh, come to that conclusion. Uh, and I think that the reality here is, uh, I, I think it's a far cry to be able to get uh, an acceptance or an admission that there is a need for, uh, or that China would be prepared to um, uh, to agree to sanctions. What I do think is the first stage is required is there needs to be a full independent inquiry into the, uh, the the timeline on this and at what stage it was believed that China fully understood that they had a human to human disease uh, which was somewhat out of control. And I think that has to happen almost immediately. China has refuted that has even attacked Australia, I see, belligerently threatening sanctions because the Australians had the timidity to, to call for one. But I think if the whole of the free world joins forces together and demands that, then I think uh, China will have no other option in the end but to open up uh, to the WHO. The WHO should be actually calling for that right now, but I think they've gone strangely silent on this matter. But uh, yeah, it's desperately important. Number one, we must get that inquiry. So how has the coronavirus changed the debate on China within the Conservative Party? Well, first of all, there was a lot of resistance. Back in the early part of the year, the big debate here in the UK was should Huawei be involved in the new 5G settlement? And now I'm one of those for some time that has believed that we have uh, cast all caution to the wind uh, under I think George Osborne particularly, uh, and uh, although it was also under Labour, but accelerated under George Osborne's time at the Treasury, that we we basically decided that we were going to open our doors, what they called this uh, golden era, I think, or something, uh, one of those sort of phrases which politicians use, which mean next to nothing. But this one was used to describe the idea that we would do business with China on a big scale. Uh, and therefore, we even had President Xi come and visit the UK. I thought he was rather patronizing when he was here, uh, uh, sort of gave us a lecture about <coughs> government uh, and democracy, which I didn't appreciate. But I have to say that the reality was that we did. And the result of all of that has been that Huawei, for example, in the last 10 years uh, has been engaged in the UK telecom system from 3G through to 4G. And now the proposal was they would come through to 5G. And the problem is that the government at the time, uh, early on this year, uh, and actually late last year, said that it was OK that they would control them into just the outer reaches. But in truth, there is no definition of outer and inner under 5G. So we mounted a case to say, that's it. It's time now that we eradicated them from any plans for 5G. But more importantly, uh, that we actually got them out of the existing systems like 4G. And the government dismissed us on the basis when they got elected, they had an 80 majority and therefore they wouldn't have to worry. But intriguingly, when we tried to amend a bill back in March before lockdown, uh, we very nearly succeeded uh, in getting enough votes. Now, that has frightened the government significantly. It shows them that scale of a problem existed since coronavirus and China's involvement in that. I have to tell you, those numbers have grown significantly. So the government now knows uh, that it has to come forward with plans to eradicate Huawei from their future systems. Uh, and those will be tested quite soon, I think, uh, in a bill that's to be brought forward. So it started with Huawei. It's hardened under coronavirus. And now, of course, even yesterday, uh, on Monday, that is, um, I held a, an urgent question calling the government to the dispatch box to answer over a report that the IPAC uh, group, of which I am a, a co-chair, has managed to publish alongside Associated Press, showing through government documents in China uh, that the Chinese are complicit in what I think now, frankly, could almost certainly be defined as a form of genocide on the Uyghurs in Xinjiang province. Uh, and it's all there to see. And that is a shocking revelation. And then if you add to that, as I said at the time, you know, their, their, their expansionism, uh, outside of China, the South China Seas in contravention of the UN's uh, commission. Uh, they're bullying, it seems, on the border with India. Uh, they're <clears throat> somewhat threatening behavior over Taiwan. Uh, all that I said, the breach of trade law and, and regulations, the crackdown on Hong Kong, which uh, I think in the next two days is due to have major changes to its law in contravention of the agreement with the UK on the basic law. Uh, and importantly, 
uh, the stated view that President Xi himself wants to uh, see China as the dominant military force uh, by the 2040s, uh, such that it would be able then, if necessary, to take Taiwan by force. All of these are clear and open and obvious. So I think people here in the UK, particularly politicians now, have finally grasped that this is a genuine problem. I want to circle back to the golden era, as uh, David Cameron and George Osborne uh, called it, between the UK and China. Was this a major strategic mistake made by the Cameron and Osborne government? Yes. Well, it's a pretty clear, pretty clear and definitive uh, answer. So, um, <clears throat> would you, moving sort of maybe swiftly on, um, where is the current resistance to the change on China that you've been uh, pushing for? inside the British system and inside Parliament and in the British uh, economy, perhaps, uh, more broadly? Well, hugely... Who's trying to stop this? <clears throat> Sorry? Who's trying to stop this change on China? Well, I think the main <clears throat> problem is that a huge number of companies, including the telcos, have got themselves incredibly involved with China, uh, as I said earlier on, on, on the production of equipment. Uh, but it doesn't stop there. Uh, China is now involved in our nuclear power station uh, program, which uh, I have genuine question marks uh, over uh, to a huge degree. They're also heavily involved in the wind farm, uh, offshore wind farm process, because so much of that equipment uh, derives from China. There are other places too, but there is a significant degree of that. Uh, and the big problem in all these areas is that Chinese money uh, is seen as a very helpful process in developing key areas. And so uh, you've got the establishment. Uh, I think Treasury is concerned here because, of course, they worry what will happen if China uh, uh, disappears from these uh, investments, uh, who will replace them. And at the other side of the fence, you've got a lot of businesses who... <clears throat> have vested interest. I mean, I'm absolutely appalled, to be quite frank with you, the number of, of the great and the good who have now managed to find themselves on boards, particularly here with Huawei. I don't know how much they're paid, but I should assume that it is significant amounts of money, uh, which I think really, uh, by the way, doesn't persuade anybody here internally, but it does show uh, that there is an element of greed going on in some of this as well, which rather bothers me. And so, in reality, it, it is essentially an establishment problem. Uh, it's a lack of imagination in the establishment. It's a lack of understanding. It's a short-termism which happens. Uh, and in many senses, if you're not careful, history teaches us time and time again, uh, when the establishment thinks that it's too difficult a problem to resolve, then the problem that comes down the tracks is even bigger. And we've got tons of that through history not least of which, of course, is the 1930s and the failure to confront uh, what was a growing problem uh, in Germany with, again, uh, a government that uh, professed some very nasty and, uh, and uh, dictatorial uh, attitudes towards a whole series of freedoms and rights in the early stages and then militarily. So my concern is history teaches us to make sure you deal with these problems early. If we become too dependent, and I think we are close to that now, on China, then it makes it even more difficult in the years to come to face up to China. You know, and the truth is, successive Western governments, not just the UK, has been supine in the face of what is a real problem. Uh, and you know, just look at Tibet. You know, uh, uncomfortable when Cameron saw the Dalai Lama. China threatened us and told us that this is unacceptable. And I'm not even certain whether he ever raised it again. If he did, it would be one of those sort of conversations. Uh, uh, with uh, with the Chinese government, in which you would, you'd say something like this. Um, well, I, I just want to uh, to mention Tibet. Silence. Anyway, moving on uh, from that, so that the press release following it says, we definitely mentioned Tibet. <laughs> yeah, we did. And boy, that worried them. So my point is that uh, not one single country, and I'm even beginning to believe that with the USA, which is arguably the only country, uh, capable and sizable enough uh, to worry the Chinese. But I think the whole of the free world now needs to come together to say, we didn't construct a rules-based order. We didn't go for human rights uh, after the Second World War uh, because we thought that they were add-ons. We went for them because 
governments that are not democratic, governments that aren't believers in the rule of law, and governments that don't support their own people through a concept of natural rights, uh, these are not governments that should access uh, the free market in the same way that the others do, who consider themselves to be uh, 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 free countries, as it were. So that, that is a critical definition. And we've, we've swept all that aside in our rush uh, to make products cheaper and our rush to get, uh, to get China engaged. And now, of course, China is dominant in so many key areas. They strategically position themselves. So going beyond even some of these technology areas where all our phones are made in China and the motherboards, et cetera, and the assembly. Uh, you also now know that the rare earth materials, about 85% of all the rare earth materials that go to the making of batteries and uh, the technology and the microchips, <clears throat> these are all uh, held now in the possession of China. Uh, you know, many of these uh, rare earth material mines have closed down because they weren't supported uh, by other countries. So the result is now they control that market to a degree which is worrying. You know, look at the Belt and Road project and the way in which they lend money out. They earn about 20%, I think, of Africa's debt. But, you know, I was looking at a country the other day, who I won't name, but they got a loan from China. Uh, and of course, the Chinese loans aren't like US or British loans. We don't tell them they have to buy British equipment. Chinese loans ensure that actually the money comes straight back to China because they have to buy Chinese telecoms equipment and Chinese engineers go in and the support isn't great. So my point is this whole process is a strategic place. It's a strategic decision to go and use the money that they now earn as a result of the free world's constant demand uh, for products that's cheaper, um, that they're able to use that in a way that meets their strategic aims. And so my answer is, I think the free world needs to have some strategic aims uh, to protect the idea of democracy, the rule of law, and the concept of human rights. And we can't turn a blind eye anymore. Tell me about your thoughts on the other side of the house. What is the Labour Party's uh, current attitude to China? I saw there were some quite strong statements by the Shadow Foreign Secretary, Lisa Nandy. Do you think that Labour has re-entered the anti-authoritarian frame after the Corbyn era, or is it still in a different place? Mm -hmm. Well, anything after Jeremy Corbyn's tenure is an advance in the concept of uh, criticism for what I call the despotic regimes. I often used to think with Mr. Corbyn and some of his team, they found it always easy to criticize America uh, uh, and to attack America, but very difficult somehow to criticize uh, Russia and or China, and for that matter, quite often Iran. Uh, that has now changed, there's no question. So I welcome uh, the fact that the Labour Party um, does actually seem to share the same concerns about our relationship with China. Uh, during the course of my urgent question yesterday on the maltreatment of the Uyghurs, uh, the Labour frontbench spokesman uh, was um, Stephen Kinnock, son of Neil Kinnock, uh, was very, very strong indeed. In fact, fully agreed with pretty much everything that I said, called for almost exactly the same things to happen. And I think um, I think that shows that Parliament and everybody else that took part in the questions to the minister, which went on for an hour, every single one of them, Labour, Scott Nats, Liberal, Conservatives, all of them basically were on the same side, which is, we have a problem here, what are you going to do about it? So staying on the topic of parliaments, uh, tell us about the Inter-Parliamentary Alliance on uh, China. Well, this is an idea we came up with here because um, uh, I was concerned that I come back to the point I made earlier, which is I do genuinely believe that no single country now is in a position to uh, force China into any change because they can disregard that country basically sanction them or whatever and get on with the others and in the greed which is necessary <clears throat> in some of these countries you know they all oh i don't want to get caught by that i'm going to carry on trading so what we have to do is get all the countries together uh, what i loosely describe as the free world uh, and try and get them to focus together on what do we do about this growing problem uh, and uh, ipac was a uh, is is an attempt to lead the way on that so what we came up with is that there would be it's an interparliamentary group, so there would be two <coughs> co-chairs for every country, one on the conservative side, one on what we'd loosely describe as the left, 
uh, in parliamentary terms, and they would be co-chairs, and then each country would have their two co-chairs and would join IPAC, and then in each country, uh, people from those legislatures who were not the co-chairs could join as well to support them, so there's an information flow. I think we now have 16 countries involved, which includes the five eyes, all of them, including the United States. <clears throat> in, the, in the United States, we have um, uh, Mr. Menendez, Senator Menendez, and also Senator Rubio, so both two pretty senior uh, characters in the Senate, so they're the co-chairs there, myself here uh, with Baroness Kennedy, who's a well-known uh, and strong international human rights advocate and lawyer. Uh, but all around the, the rest of these countries, whether it's uh, Germany, France, Italy, uh, or uh, Sweden, Scandinavia generally, Japan, uh, th they've all joined and we're getting more and more and we're in discussions with India to join as well. So, so you can see this is broadening out quite dramatically, far faster than I thought. And the idea is that IPAC is to lead the way and show that it is possible for coordinated action to put pressure on China. So when we did the UQ yesterday, that is the urgent question, uh, on the issue of the of the maltreatment of the, the Uyghurs, um, something along similar lines, because each parliament has different ways of doing it, has happened in pretty much every single country. So every parliament was made aware of this report uh, and has condemned the uh, findings of the report uh, and in America, I gather, there was a, a cross-party letter written, uh, I think, yesterday, which uh, was going to finish off the end of the day because of the way it rolled in the timescale. So it did show that it is possible to coordinate. It's possible to show China uh, that they're not going to pick us off one by one any longer, uh, that, that we mean business, and we're not prepared to be cowed by threats of bullying. And Australia's put up with a lot of threats of bullying recently, and some of the politicians that are on IPAC themselves have been personally threatened in that regard. And so uh, us coming and joining with them, as I <clears throat> call solidarity, really matters to countries that find themselves out on a limb. You know, if Australia gets bullied, we all get bullied and we should all stand together. So staying in uh, Washington uh, for a moment, do you agree with President Trump's China policy? Well, um, you have me slightly there because uh, I, if I understand the China policy, it is now that uh, the USA is deeply concerned about the behavior of China across a range of issues. I know that the, 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 um, uh, the uh, Secretary of State uh, has made some very strong comments and actually came out as well yesterday, I understand it, uh, <clears throat> and condemned uh, China over the, the treatment of the Uyghurs. Uh, so that seems to be very much in line with where we are. But I also understand, I think, uh, that all sides of the of the house, as it were, are pretty much share a similar intention uh, towards China and determination now to make some changes. Um, and there's no question that the sanctions regime on China worried the Chinese very, very significantly. Uh, for all the bluster, um, it definitely worried them. Uh, and as I say, America is the only country that really by itself can have that effect <clears throat> because of the scale of their economy. But I do think now we need to have a, a, much, a much clearer approach from the states about bringing in all the other nations to this process as per I IPAC so that it isn't just you know, Washington speaking, it's actually a consensus across all these countries about how we act together. And I think America is clearly going to have to be the lead partner in all of that, although I think the UK has a, a strong role to play with its own contacts. Uh, but that notwithstanding, I would like to see Washington, the present government, <clears throat> President Trump, but even as they're running to an election on the other side, the Democrats, committing to the idea that whoever is in power after this election, we will now see leadership uh, in a way that we perhaps haven't seen for some significant time for the free world from the United States, because this is urgent and it is serious. And if we don't deal with it now, and if America doesn't step up to that role that it must play, then I think we'll all be the poorer for it. So circling back to Britain, are you confident that Huawei will be gone from Britain's 5G uh, network by the end of the year? Yeah, I'm more confident than the government is. So I want to 
drill down on this question of nuclear power plants that you uh, mentioned earlier. So should China's involvement in the construction of these new nuclear power plants be scrapped? Well, they're already heavily involved in one that is pretty near to completion. Now they're bidding for other ones uh, with the French company, ERG. Uh, I do understand that the technology in the first power station, which has already been built in, in France, uh, doesn't work. It certainly doesn't work yet. Uh, and therefore, my concern is that we commit to stuff, A, that <clears throat> frankly, I don't think is properly tested, and B, I don't think we need. Uh, I think there are plenty of other ways of generating power for the UK rather than these vast great leviathans, uh, which are built on a huge scale. Uh, but for every nuclear power station, the problem is you've got to have backup in gas or some other process, maybe coal or oil, so that when the nuclear power station goes down, you don't lose power. This is unique to nuclear power stations. I, <clears throat> I am much more interested <clears throat> in, um, in tidal power, which I think for the UK is the absolute way ahead. We have very high rises of tides uh, across particularly the west coast of the UK, many potential lagoons. And the beauty of this, there's already one being tested out now in Swansea, which should be built. The key thing about this is, about 90% of the equipment in there would be built within the UK and designed within the UK uh, and will bring jobs to the sort of areas that the present prime minister promised to uplift. And so those seaside towns and those industrial areas which got left behind in the last 20 years or so, they would see a renewed amount of work and skilling, which may even itself lead to exports. So I'd be great if the UK started investing in the UK a bit more and a little less in rushing to China. But by the way, the China on nuclear power is not the only problem. I mean, let's just take another look at something. We are now rushing in the UK to try and get to uh, carbon-free uh, transport, certainly public transport, <clears throat> by the year 2050. And there's talk about public transport getting there earlier. Of course, at the moment, they look at battery power. Now, we can argue about whether or not we should be looking much more at hydrogen and the development of the hydrogen fuel cell and things. And that's a debate for a, another day. I know the UK is one of the leaders in that as well. But what bothers me very slightly is that as soon as this was announced out, local government after local government seems to have rushed to China. Now, China has a monopoly almost, not quite, of battery production uh, uh, because that's one of their strategic areas Looking down the road, they saw that uh, electrical power was going to be required, and they've made themselves, uh, again, a bit like Huawei and the telecoms uh, uh, systems, um, dominant in this area. And now, of course, the UK is about to make itself a whole lot more dependent on Chinese technology, including they're having backdoors into the technology. Uh, and, of course, the companies that produce these batteries will require uh, that you only use their systems, otherwise these batteries cannot be recharged or refocused. So the answer is this becomes a greater level of dependency. And I, I question this, and I've questioned it to the government, said, you know, really, do, do we need now to do this? Why are we not talking about, you know, the free world having markets in these until we realize that China has changed and they haven't changed. So we've got to reinvestigate all of these areas because we've blindly gone into this and seen no strategy at all. Whereas, to be fair to China, everything is strategic. So, crossing the world again to Hong Kong uh, in these sort of fateful days as uh, China's repressive security law seems to be set to uh, mm. be imposed. What is the status of uh, British foreign policy towards Hong Kong? Mm. What do you make of those endeavours to stand by uh, the Sino-British uh, Treaty and uh, what do you think uh, the consequences of Britain's move uh, to uphold that is going to be? Well, the truth is the British government has condemned the change, uh, which we've seen some leaks of, but I don't know whether they're correct. I know it's due in the next day or two. And so we'll see, but <clears throat> this will change uh, the relationship of the basic law completely. It breaches the Sino-British uh, agreement uh, signed over Hong Kong, one country, two systems. Um, and that is an international obligation. It's not just something China can overturn itself. 
So it breaches all of this. This is very much par for the course with China. Uh, so we are left with the problem that the UK condemns it and the government has done so and says that it will wait now to see what the law change is before being very explicit. But again, this, this rather highlights uh, the problem that the UK alone <coughs> cannot have a lasting effect on, uh, on China's position. What we need is the, the whole free world to come together and accept that what China does today for Hong Kong will be their attitude to Taiwan tomorrow, and in many senses, their attitude to pretty much most of the countries and areas around their borders, because once they get away with it, <clears throat> they will go on repeating that process uh, because it will be too late. And as I said, we've seen this before. We've seen this before. You know, in the 1930s, we saw very similar processes where the, 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 the free world turned away from criticism. What we have to do is come together and say, this is unacceptable. And we together must talk about what we do, whether it's <clears throat> in terms of discussed sanctions or uh, breaches in trade, whatever it happens to be. I think governments must now come together and say to China, you make these changes at your peril because we are simply not going to put up with it and if that's the case then we're going to have to review our commercial relationships uh, with China in a very significant way. Something I want to ask you about is the offer made by the Prime Minister of a pathway to citizenship for the <coughs> British nationals uh, overseas which could potentially see up to 2.9 million people be able to leave Hong Kong and come to live in Britain and become British citizens. I'm curious for your uh, your views on this? Well, I'm completely in favour of it. Uh, we need to offer them some place to go should they find it too onerous. Um, I think it's a generous offer. It's almost unprecedented, although we did do something similar for the Ugandan Asians at the time of Idi Amin in Uganda, uh, but this was a much smaller number. We're talking here very sizable numbers. I have in the House asked if the government would also talk to our friends and allies about all of them stepping up being prepared to take a uh, proportion of <clears throat> many of those uh, who may have to flee Hong Kong uh, for various reasons uh, to give them the same rights. Uh, I know that many would like to go to Australia because it's not as far away from Hong Kong. There are other countries nearer that they would like to be part of uh, rather than just come all the way to the UK. But it's a generous offer from the UK. It's well meant and it will be backed up by reality. But I would like to see our other friends and allies all say, look, we'll share the burden we will share the burden and i have to tell you <clears throat> these are some of the most skillful and intelligent people on the planet uh, so they will certainly add and contribute to the countries they go to but the important thing is the human rights of this and it's the right thing to do so what do you make of china's bullying of uh, hsbc <coughs> and what do you make of the fact that uh, britain's largest bank said that it backed uh, china's repressive security law yeah, I was asked this on a radio interview, uh, and I hadn't really uh, focused on it very much when they asked me, but it made, literally, as I answered the question, it became very apparent to me. I don't bank with HSBC uh, or any other bank that's been involved in this, but I have publicly said, if I did bank with them, I wouldn't bank now. And I think it's beholden on the those who bank with them to say to them, this is simply unacceptable. The moment you kowtow to a dictatorial regime like this, you no longer make yourself uh, look reasonable in terms of your banking offer. I don't want to know that the bank that I bank with uh, is prepared to be pushed around by regimes like this, because that means that essentially they're not free. And I'm not prepared to bank in an organization uh, that bends the knee to authoritarian regimes like this. I'm sorry that's not on. So my view is very simply, uh, I, and I think this has already happened, quite a lot have left their accounts uh, at these banks, but I would say to everybody else, you should go too, because frankly, the bank itself should recognize that once you compromise on freedom, then there should be consequences for you. And I think those consequences are they should lose those accounts. What do you make of the Treasury's concerns about Britain cutting ourselves off from Chinese growth? And what do you make of the Treasury's uh, hostility in general to the more sort of aggressive uh, sides of China decoupling? Uh, 
It's been my experience in government, because I was six years uh, running a department as a Secretary of State, uh, but it's been my experience in government and out that the Treasury is almost the last part of government ever to get it. Uh, that is because they always uh, model everything from where they are now, but they don't really genuinely come with an open mind <clears throat> to how you would replace those systems that you are so busy buying in China uh, or where you would get your trade from. Uh, and so my general sense is the Treasury will come along. They're worried, obviously, they're worried about the effect on the economy, and that's justifiable. Uh, but my view is that it is wholly feasible within the free world for us to create the sort of things uh, that are being done in China. There are plenty of other countries around the world in the Far East, as well as here in the West, uh, that can step up to that mark. Uh, our problem is uh, that we've been very monotracked, as it were, into China for all of these bits and pieces. And the truth is right now, you question whether this is good value for money, because this whole concept of <clears throat> democracy, the rule of law, and human rights uh, affects every single aspect of a free economy. And it's free for those reasons. Uh, you can't limit those things and still have a free economy. And there is a price to pay for cheap goods from China. And that price is that you turn a blind eye to all of the abuses taking place in China. As I say yesterday, the issue around this uh, forced sterilization of Uyghur women should lead you absolutely cold, no matter whether you're on the treasury, in a bank, or in a business, or whatever, you have to ask yourself this question. How much is that so-called economic change worth to you? Without freedom, there's no economy. I couldn't agree more that the news out of uh, Xinjiang is absolutely chilling. So a question mm. I have you next is, who are the <clears> most <throat> prominent pro-Chinese politicians mm in British public life. Are there any names that should be named? Is there a sort of cast of shame here that you'd like to draw attention to? Well, you'll forgive me. I'm never a great one for naming names. Uh, and I think you can probably figure that one out yourself when you get to look at the list of those who have stood up and ended China. I, but I'm not going to name names. All I would say is there are a list of the great and the good uh, who have, as I say, uh, bowed to China, but done so with their wallets wide open. Uh, my view about that is, well, if that's what you think about freedom, then good luck to you. But the majority of the British public, and what's quite heartening here, by the way, once you get past the establishment, once you get out into the country, when if I write something or post it on, um, on uh, China and about my concerns about the abuses of freedoms and the abuse of the marketplace and all these things, um, I find I get an enormous pickup and everybody says, this is wrong, this has got to stop. So the instinct of British people beyond what I call the political bubble is very clear on this. They don't like it. And I would think the instinct of uh, people in America, in France, uh, you name it, in all these countries, when they see stuff like what's happening to the Uyghurs, they want to know why they're politicians are not doing something about it. So the push from this normally comes from below. You know, it's just like appeasement, really. You know, appeasement was an establishment concept, but it was broken by those who were not in the establishment. And that's exactly what we have to do now. So just staying on that political bubble for a moment, is there a problem mm. with the Foreign Office? Is there a, something malfunctioning about it? Is there an attitude problem? Is there a culture problem in it? And is it really a Rolls-Royce service, as we've uh, sort of fondly called it in Britain over many of the past decades? Well, I think there's huge skill in the Foreign Office. Uh, there are many very skillful operators uh, and uh, highly intelligent people. I don't doubt all that. I think as an institution, it has the capacity uh, to project uh, British interests abroad. But I do think that, um, and there's change now coming because the government's announced a change in this <clears throat> and uh, changing the nature of the department. But I think it does now need to recognize a bit more what the UK's real interests are. <clears throat> and it isn't all just commercial. <clears throat> I think things like uh, the, uh, the treatment of the Uyghurs is a very, very vital moment 
uh, when I would hope the Foreign Office would lead now in arguing within government that it is time that we changed our relationship with China and that we led the way. I would love to see the UK lead the way, you know, as passionate historical believers in freedom, uh, in, in human rights, in the concept of the rule of law. I mean, after all, the free market was a British concept. It relies on those freedoms, the freedom of choice. You know, the concept of parliamentary democracy was a was a, a, an early British uh, derived concept and has stood the test of time. You know, all these things are, <clears throat> are some of the best of what we do. And within human rights, it was the British that were were, were very key to trying to draft up, you know, for example, the European Charter on Human Rights and, uh, and were very critical within the UN uh, Charter. So my point is, these are who we are, really, alongside our great friends and allies like the states and others who have all got similar views in freedom. You know, once you trespass on freedom, once you take away rights like that, then things tend to come straight at you from those that uh, that go along with that. And I think simply the British must lead now. The free world is looking, I think, for leadership in where we should go, bringing them together <clears throat> and saying to everybody, let's now speak with one voice. So I hope the Foreign Office will lead on that, uh, regardless of who the Secretary of State is or the ministers are. So, you know, leadership uh, in terms of uh, <laughs> making a strong and powerful uh, institution requires money. So I'm curious to know, whether you think the proposed cuts by the Treasury will impact Britain's foreign policy capacity? Well, we'll wait and see. But I think that, by and large, the involvement now with uh, what used to be called, or is still called DFID, the International uh, Aid Department, back into the Foreign Office, will change the Foreign Office, actually. And I think the way in which uh, the Foreign Office works will become influenced by that process. And I think that may well turn out to be a good thing. Uh, and uh, it will help the Foreign Office. But, you know, the truth right now is that um, it isn't a matter of money, it's a matter of policy. Policy is critical, and we need to be able to project that concept of what Britain believes in, and the Foreign Office can do that, and should do that, and should lead on that, and that's the main thing, I think. So in terms of that leadership and projecting uh, a vision for Britain in international affairs, do you support the idea of a D10 of the world's leading democracies to supplant the G7, adding South Korea, Australia and uh, India? Yeah, no, I do. I think the wider we go with the free world, the only qualification must be that countries must be democracies, they must be governed by the rule of law, and they must agree and believe in human rights. If those three things are met, then they should be involved in a wider grouping. As I say, you know, our IPAC system has now 16 countries involved in it. Uh, and I therefore think we can go much further even than 10. I think it's important to have groupings together, uh, or even more than that. We need to be able to reach out to countries in the Far East, uh, to, to show them that we're with them because they feel quite threatened, uh, as well as Europe and America and uh, even South America. So in terms of uh, groupings that we could potentially do more with, what do you think of the future of the Five Eyes uh, Security Alliance? And do you think mm. that Five Eyes should be expanded to include potentially Japan or France or other uh, non-traditional uh, core security allies? Yeah, I do. I, <clears throat> I think now that we know what the real problem is, and it's staring us in the face, we need to reach out to countries that are even closer to that problem than physically than we are. So Japan is absolutely the case in question, and certainly uh, other European countries uh, should be involved. And clearly, obviously, uh, we have the Five Eyes as a core spine, but I think we can add to that those that we know. I mean, you've got to be quite secure when it comes to intelligence. So you need to make that assessment because the sharing of intelligence is critical. But uh, there are a number of countries we can, <clears throat> we can certainly involve, and I wouldn't be against that at all. In terms of uh, what Britain mm. can do next uh, to show leadership on China, what do you think um, the UK and the US should be pushing together? What specific initiatives would you mm. like to see Boris Johnson and uh, Donald Trump or whoever is uh, president uh, in November, uh, teaming up together with uh, London to propose? 
Well, I would uh, I would like to see uh, the UK government with the Americans and others, <clears throat> but certainly the two countries leading to say to China that their behavior across a range of areas is now unacceptable. And that uh, if that doesn't change, and if they pull back from this aggressive uh, and deliberate attempt to, to pervert essentially the markets, <clears throat> the nature of, uh, of human rights and of their borders, uh, then we must start looking again at our relationship in commercial terms with them. Uh, and bear in mind uh, that has a very powerful effect. America's already did that once, and that really did worry the Chinese. I think if other countries joined that, and we were saying we're going to start looking to create alternatives to what is being done in China. So, you know, plenty of other countries, I said earlier, that we could <clears throat> do business with, we can invest in, we can start producing this. I see no reason why we should have to run to China for our batteries, why these can't be produced uh, uh, in other countries in the free world and even in the UK or in America. You know, why we have to rely on telecoms. I was told the other day that it's because uh, Huawei is technologically more advanced than other countries. That is completely untrue. Uh, uh, companies like Ericsson are far more advanced <coughs> than, <coughs> than Huawei. And we also know that the microchips uh, designed in the United States are 10, 12 years ahead of anything produced in China. And Huawei depends on those things. So it's not about technology advance. It's about the low cost of production that makes it so attractive. And we need to be able to counter that uh, by ensuring that we can produce things in a way that is cheaper, but also at the same time to give it a greater range of choice. So all of that, I think we should be saying to them, you will leave us with no other option but to start moving away from you as a marketplace. Uh, and China needs to grow every year because one of the issues about China is <clears throat> it's got the acquiescence of the Chinese public because their living conditions improve every year, year in, year out. Uh, but without that growth that comes from Western investment and Western trade, uh, that would very quickly stall. And so that would start to put pressure on China. So my view is China shouldn't just assume that the West is supine and will go along all the time. We need to lead on saying, now we need to make some changes. Now we need to think about this very carefully and decide to what degree uh, does this dependence on China give us a lever. So you mentioned Australia uh, earlier and how Australia has been uh, under Chinese pressure in the last uh, few months. What specific things could London do now to support Australia? And should we take more seriously ideas such as Kanzuk and sort of integrating our economies and foreign policy structures together with uh, Canada, Australia mm. and uh, New Zealand uh, more seriously than we have in the past. Uh, are you a yes. supporter? No, no question. I mean, I think the way ahead for the UK as it leaves the EU uh, is immediately to develop free trade arrangements with <clears throat> countries like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, obviously the United States, uh, but also other groups. Japan is up on the, uh, the Pan-Pacific Partnership. Uh, this is where the UK should be involved in all of these. Uh, and I would say also that we've got to come to terms with the fact that a threat on Australia is a threat to us all. We just can't afford to leave them isolated like this uh, when China starts bullying them, as they were trying to do the other day when they called for an independent inquiry. Uh, it was a very simple request uh, made by the prime minister. Um, and immediately China said that they would impose sanctions <clears throat> on uh, on Australia. And Australia is somewhat vulnerable because it is a big, it's actually one of the few net exporters uh, to China, and therefore it is a, a significant trader. And so we'll feel vulnerable. So I mean, the, the rest of the free world's got to turn around and say, well, uh, we're going to stand with you on this. And if you threaten sanctions on one, you threaten sanctions on us all, uh, and we will react accordingly. Uh, and your trade may suffer. So I think it's time for us to, to, to build together that process in commercial terms that allows us to stand together in, and recognize that the vulnerability may well be Chinese vulnerability because their, their need for our business is so great. So do you think that we are engaged in a new Cold War with China? And what's the end game of this uh, approach you're calling for? Is it 
the replacement of the Chinese Communist Party and the emergence of a democratic China, a sort of 1989, 1991 uh, moment in Asia? Or is it simply a return to how we saw the Chinese Communist Party behaving in the 1990s? Which well, we're not going to meddle. The number one thing is it's not about meddling in internal Chinese affairs. That's well, who governs them is ultimately up to them and uh, the Chinese people. But I think that when uh, George Osborne and others decided they were going to have this golden period uh, of trade, they used to say to me and others who were a bit skeptical, they said, well, don't worry, the free trade will open up China and uh, it in due course will become a, a proper pucker uh, government with which it has democracy and human rights and all the other things. The free trade will change them. Uh, and um, I said I didn't think that was the case because it was such a significantly large country that it could afford and would afford to be able to stand with its own form of government. <clears throat> so I said that it's unlikely to. But even at that time, uh, as they were doing it, China was following a more diplomatic course uh, than it is today. It was being more cautious about its relationships um, had been difficult on Tibet, to be fair, but on a number of other areas, it was a little more cautious prior to that. Uh, I think that has changed. And what has happened is this present government has become quite aggressive, uh, very determined about what China's role in the world should be, and <clears throat> very demanding about that. And I think that has been the big change. So the, the, the thing that has been proved to be false is the idea that free trade alone changes governments. It does not. If free trade is successful, then bad governments can sit and reap the dividends of free trade and have less pressure to change than they would have done otherwise. Uh, the collapse of the, <clears throat> the Berlin Wall and uh, those communist regimes in Eastern Europe didn't happen because they were booming economies, having a great time uh, trading freely on the open market. It happened because their economies were bad economies and they were unable to trade. Uh, and therefore had very little money and the condition of the people was very poor. So, so the free trade alone doesn't change all of this. This is a great misnomer amongst uh, liberals uh, in the Western world uh, that the free markets change things. They don't. Governments change things uh, and, and, and freedom-loving governments who obey the rule of law and agree with uh, human rights, uh, they are better partners than those that don't. And it's also worth being judged by what the uh, Chinese Communist Party has in their own words of where they think they wish to be. And as I said, that's very clear. Their level of determination to be dominant is absolutely critical. And furthermore, they also believe that the Chinese form of government is the only government that works. So they're not, by no means, are they thinking that maybe there are accommodations and changes that could be made because they've made it very clear they think this is ultimately uh, between two forms of government. One is uh, the, the democratic countries and the other one is the Chinese concept of government with uh, freer markets, but with a rigid and strict uh, governing regime, <coughs> which holds all the authority. Uh, and they see themselves winning out in that. And that's how they see it. So it's a reasonable and fair debate. Uh, but right now we are rather proving their point, which is the West's failure to uh, to meet a challenge and to see that challenge early on rather lends itself to the concept that they would espouse which is that weakness is ultimately its downfall so my view is we need to prove that to be wrong and the only way we can do that is by coming together and showing that we have unity of purpose we are very clear about what the rules are and why they should be stuck to and we're not prepared to accept <clears throat> the constant and blatant breaches of those rules, whether it be human rights or in trading matters. Uh, and therefore, there are consequences to those. Uh, and I think that's really important. So that's how I would measure it. It's the battle between two ideologies, uh, that of, uh, of democracy uh, in the concept of freedom, rule of law and human rights, <clears throat> and that of a dictatorial strict regime formed around communist principles the Brooks and is intolerant to uh, to all uh, dissent uh, and rules centrally uh, with unelected governments. That is the challenge. It's the perennial challenge. It hasn't changed, and it is our job once again to ensure uh, that it is democracy and freedom that wins out in the end, not the other way around.
So my last question for you before I let you go is, if we don't stand up to China, what do you think the worst case scenario is by 2030? What will the world look like if we don't take action now? Well, it'll be a very different place. It will be a place where uh, endless countries become uh, satellite states, really, I think, uh, where they're not big enough or strong enough to be able to stand <clears throat> up to the sort of nature of the bullying and the threats that take place. Uh, and I think the challenge for the West will be our dependency will grow, uh, our independence will shrink, and our ability to do anything in 10 years' time will be much diminished. As I say, if the China plan is correct uh, by 2040, uh, the Chinese will be the dominant nation. If that is the case, uh, then that uh, reduces our capacity to act uh, across the board. The time is now. We must take that challenge. We must act now. We must come together and recognize where this path is leading us and change it. Ian Duncan Smith, thank you very much for joining us uh, today. My pleasure. Thank you.